My name is Stephen Davidson. I'm the Director of PR and Communications at the Ministry of Health and Wellness. And our Minister of Health and Wellness, Dr. Honorable Christopher Tufton, he is joined by the Honorable Favorel Williams, our Minister of Education and Youth, our Permanent Secretary, Mr. Dunstan Bryan in the Ministry of Health and Wellness, our Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Jacqueline Bissiesa McKenzie. We also have online with us Dr. Karen Webster Carr, our National Epidemiologist, Dr. Nadine Williams, our Director of Health Services Planning and Integration. And we want to acknowledge our other directors and team from the Ministry of Health and Wellness, the Ministry of Education and Youth, and the Regional Health Authorities. At this time, I'll hand over to our minister who would give us his update. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I want to thank you for joining us on this uh, COVID conversation, unusual time. Nevertheless, we appreciate your being here. And I want to welcome my colleague, Minister Fable Williams, uh, for joining. Uh, just a, a few things. I, I do know that we have quite a number of persons online, unusually so. And I am discerning that uh, most are parents, perhaps teachers within the education space. Um, the, 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 this is a, a press brief that we are catering primarily to the media in terms of questions, queries, after giving, of course, the, the briefing on COVID, as we normally do. We welcome the parents and others who are online, but I know that the minister will speak um, when, she, when, when she speaks later to a forum which would involve parents um, to address any issues of concern. So just to say, we appreciate your being online. We welcome you, you can certainly stay. Um, just mute your mics, but as it relates to questions after, I uh, would want to encourage you to hold on those until when you meet with the Honourable Minister, who will speak to some of the issues in education um, during the course of this discussion. Thank you very much. So again, I want to welcome you to our COVID conversation, uh, where we seek to update the public on the issues around COVID. And we felt that it was necessary to have a conversation today, um, given a, a couple of issues that we need the public to be kept informed on. Um, firstly, I want to begin by saying that we can, Jamaica, that is, confirm the fifth wave of our, the COVID infection um, on review of the epidemiological data we can confirm that Jamaica is currently experiencing the fifth wave of COVID-19. This is based on the review of the epidemiological curves for confirmed COVID-19 cases and reproductive rates. Um, sorry, I'm gonna ask that you mute your mic. Again, we have over 200 plus persons online. Um, Stephen, you may have to control that. Just mute the mics that are open. Well, 300 now, okay, it's going to create a problem. Thank you. So again, I say we, we can confirm that we are now experiencing the fifth wave of COVID infection based on a review of the epidemiological curves for confirmed COVID-19 cases and reproductive rates to identify the infection point, inflection point for increased cases. This inflection point for the fifth wave occurred around April 20th, 2022, the inflection point is not immediately apparent. Clearly, there is a lag effect. It takes about two weeks, given that the assessment involves the use of data of onset of cases. Um, we need to allow time for presentation to the healthcare system after onset of symptoms, sampling, testing of samples, and of course, uh, reporting. This fifth wave is likely due to the Omicron subvariant BA2, given the increasing proportion of this subvariant in the population and its higher transmissibility. In the last 24 hours, we have confirmed 147 new cases, bringing our total cases on record to 133,250. Regrettably, we also recorded two deaths that occurred in February and April 2021, respectively. The total deaths from COVID-19 now stands at 3,013, with 333 still under investigation and another 252 
noted as coincidental COVID-19 deaths. Our positivity rate remains high. And in the last 24 hours, this stood at 17.6% with a seven day average positivity rate of 25.6%. Uh, so we are in the fifth wave. And you know, as the discussions will continue, you will um, discern some variations or differences between this wave and previous waves. And so this is not a signal to panic, although we must be mindful and we must take care to protect ourselves against the, the virus. And so I wanna just mention one of the best form of protection, which is the vaccination rates. So up to 8 a.m. today, Wednesday, May 18th, 1.429, 614 doses of COVID-19 vaccines have been administered across the island. That number 696,700 first doses, 593,866 second doses, and 100,100 single doses, with over 4,067 doses were administered to the immunocompromised, and 34,881 doses were given as boosters. The ministry uh, reminds the public, or would like to remind the public, that vaccines are widely available to protect you uh, uh, from severe illness. All persons 12 years and older should visit any of the over 100 vaccination centers to be vaccinated if they have not already done so. Uh, persons who are eligible for boosters are encouraged to take the booster dose now as their level of protection may have waned over time. And, and this is an important note. Um, if you have not taken your third shot, um, then it is a good time to take it because this will add to your, um, your, your res resistance or response to dealing with the virus. Um, and this, of course, is the most effective response. I'm going to invite now our national epidemiologist, Dr. Karen Webster Carr, to provide further details on the state of COVID across the island. Dr. Webster Carr. Thank you, Minister. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm just going to take you through the information with respect to the cases, um, after we've had 147 cases yesterday, we are now cumulatively at 133,250. With um, yesterday positivity, we were told already it was 17.6 and a seven day average of 25.6. We have had, 3,013 deaths so far uh, related to COVID and the distribution by year is for 2020, 329, 2021, 2,371, and 2022, 313 so far. The persons in their 20s and 30s are the persons who have had the most cases of COVID. However, the deaths are greatest in the older persons. With persons over 90, one in five or more uh, have died for those who we have confirmed to have had COVID. When we look across the parishes, the, over the last two weeks, when we look at the cases per population, the parishes with the highest rates, and these are locally acquired cases, these do not include imported cases, then St. James, Westmoreland, St. and um, Trelawney and Hanover have had the highest rates. At, to the community level, 48% of communities across the country have had, uh, are currently experiencing cases. So in the last two weeks, these are our active cases. And again, these are just the locally acquired cases. When we look at the cases over time, 
we note, we can see the peaks, the first, second, third, fourth, and now we are looking at the, the fifth peak. This is our reproductive rate for cases and admissions. So what we are noting from the reproductive rate, the rate of increase of cases is greater than the rate of increase of admission. This is what has been noted. So take putting together the reproductive rate and the cases on a chart, we note the what was spoken of earlier, the inflection point, and that's a sharp increase in cases that was seen for the fifth wave around April uh, 20th, 2022. So I'm going to just take you through the epidemiological curve, looking at different aspects. So with respect to geographical spread for this wave so far, we are just below 50%, but for the previous waves at the peak, we went to up to 75% of communities or a little bit more that were affected um, at any given period in time. With respect to the deaths over this the period, the deaths in the wave three had, was the greatest number of deaths and the greatest daily number was observed in the third wave. The next highest was in wave four, although the absolute number over the period of the wave would have been much smaller because, so if we look at the waves, so wave one would be related to the original um, SARS-CoV-2, wave two was predominantly alpha, wave three was predominantly delta, and wave four was predominantly Omicron. So far, it appears that Omicron is um, predominates for the fifth wave, but what is happening, the subvariant BA2, the proportional amount of that is increasing. So we suspect that is um, will predominate in the fifth wave. When we look at the hospital admission and con looking both on the confirmed and suspected cases, for the fifth wave so far, there's a, a gentler increase in cases. And currently the number of uh, confirmed cases are now increasing as well for those who are admitted. So when we look at the pressure on the health system for admissions, it is around medium level for admissions. With respect to the positivity rate, the positivity rate for this fifth wave is increasing at a gentler rate than previously seen in wave four, uh, where it was a sharper increase in the positivity. And so, but what we have observed so far is as we move from wave to wave, the positivity increases um, for these periods. But we're yet to see what will happen with this current wave five. So I'm going to take you a little bit through vaccination and what we have been noticing. So for the period with COVID-related deaths from March last year to present, 97.6% were unvaccinated. 0.9% had partial vaccination and 1.5% were fully vaccinated. So we looked at a period from week 35 last year to week 17 this year. And as the number of cases increases, we do get persons who were vaccinated um, being infected with COVID. And we have had persons who have 
been hospitalized and some who have died. But when we look at the proportion, while 14.3% uh, of persons who are fully vaccinated were infected, 2.7% um, were hospitalized and 2.4% showing that the, the protection gain from vaccination. I will skip this slide because Minister told you those numbers already. So when we look at the parish distribution for Jamaica, about 29.1% have at least gotten a first dose of a vaccine um, with fully vaccination being at 25.4%. The parishes with the highest vaccination coverage KSA, St. James, St. Anne, St. Elizabeth, Trelawney, those with the lowest, St. Thomas, Portland, and St. Catherine. The vaccination coverage is best in person 60, in their 60s and 70s. And females have a better coverage than males overall, except in persons 80 years and older, males have a higher coverage for that age group. So this is summarizing what our epidemiological curve looks at, the reproductive rates and the interventions that have occurred. And the red line speaks to restrictions and the green line speaks to the release of the restrictions. And um, we, we know the curfew hours on the bottom um, bar. And this represents our fifth wave to the end. So as of now, we are at um, very high transmission level with a seven day positivity rate of 25.6. Our bed occupancy is at medium pressure. Our geographical spread is at medium. Our reproductive rate is 1.3 for cases and 1.1 for admission. So both are increasing and exponentially. And our vaccination coverage level is really too low to have a good effect on transmission. Although we note the effect that is having on the individual who is vaccinated and prevention of severe disease. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Websakar, for your usual thoroughness and to your team in epidemiology for, um, for the presentation. So there you have it. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, we are in the fifth wave, confirmed by the statistics, but there are some nuances that are worthy of note uh, uh, as we approach this, this particular um, fifth wave. Uh, I, I, we may sound like a stock record, but vaccination continues to be your best protection. And unfortunately, too many persons are not. 97.5% of those who are impacted hospitalization wise are unvaccinated. And so we continue to urge persons to, to, to get vaccinated. Um, the, the, the numbers clearly are moving in the wrong direction, 25 over 25%. And it therefore is in our best interest, I think, as a country, as individuals to, to ensure that we protect ourselves starting with vaccination but I would not leave my mask or my sanitizer uh, and I would protect myself in the situations where I think I'm exposed um, to, to multiple persons because the virus is highly contagious. Um, the good news, if, there were, if, if, if one could classify it as such, is that the majority of cases appear to be mild. Uh, persons with comor comorbidities, of course, are at risk for severe illness. So those with hypertension, the diabetes, and so on, uh, who have mild symptoms and no symptoms um, may also develop. Well, let me read that again. The, the, the 
brief. While the majority of cases appear to be mild, persons with comorbidities are at risk for severe illness and persons who have mild symptoms and no symptoms may be at risk for developing long COVID. Uh, and so the public is therefore encouraged to practice infection prevention control measures, including the wearing of masks, hand washing, physical distancing, and very importantly, staying at home if you are sick. The protocols are there around staying at home if you are positive or if you feel ill, then you really ought to stay at home. And I think the protocol is up to 10 days and then you return. Um, with all of this, of course, we're trying to balance the normal restoration of activities in the society and the risk that is posed by this um, third wave. There have been an increase in hospitalization fluctuating between 150 and 180 since the beginning of May. And so they, as said in the seen in the statistics, while hospitalization is inching up, uh, the, the pace of hospitalization is far less than the, the positivity rate, the extent of the spread of the virus. And as said, we have seen 150 to 180 um, over the last, over the month of May. Many of the cases are suspected cases also who are discharged after test results. And many of the confirmed cases are clients hospitalized for other conditions who coincidentally are tested for positive for COVID. As a result, the hospitals are still returning to routine activities as they are not overwhelmed. Uh, you will recall that we had a certain capacity up to 740 or so beds, even though some have been returned to normal activities and we are continuing on that trajectory to try and deal with some of the backlog cases. But we're monitoring the situation very closely. So if we have to pivot or adjust, we will. For a closer look at the patients in hospitals, I invite the Director of Health Services at this time, Health Services Planning and Integration, Dr. Nadine Williams, Nadine Williams, to give an update on hospitalization. Dr. Williams. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Minister. Good morning, Dr. Potato McKenzie. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Bryan, Permanent Secretary. I am I'm going to be sharing my screen. And I believe you're able to see that now. Will you be able to? Are you able to see the screen? Uh, yes, we're seeing. Go ahead, um, Dr. Williams. Right. Um, thank you for this opportunity. And with respect to the state of our hospitalizations, we would have um, followed through with what you had said, Minister, and what Dr. Webster Carr would have said, because this slide uh, speaks to us about what has been happening over the last seven days. It's a seven day summary of our COVID hospitalizations. And we recognize that this it shows an increase in comparison to what would have happened in about March when we were looking at less than 50 persons in hospital at, at, at any given time. Over the last week, we would have noticed a creeping up of the numbers um, of persons in hospitalized, who are hospitalized in our isolation beds um, for COVID, both confirmed and suspected. And specifically, as it relates to the daily admission and discharges for the period between May 11th and uh, yesterday, we would have noted a, a, a slight disparity of moving away from an uncoupling between our admissions and our discharges. And so whereas the numbers of admissions and discharges are still very modest, um, we noted that there was an increase, a significant increase by about 13 of the numbers of persons who ad were admitted to our isolation. And um, we certainly would want to keep an eye on this because if there is a, a significant a sustained increase in the numbers of admissions, then it would not do well for the numbers of 
persons who cumulatively over two weeks would have been in uh, or, or beds. So just to summarize to say, there has been a slight creeping up of the numbers of persons hospitalized in our isolation beds. And, and yet there seems to be a, a small uncoupling, at least we would have noted that in one day between the admissions and the discharges. When we look at the overall, as it relates to bed occupancy, we tend to look at uh, the isolation beds as it relates to the general isolation beds for persons who are essentially moderately ill, and then the HDU or high dependency units and the intensive care units for those who are more critically ill. We would have had 10 beds assigned for persons who needed um, care for critical illness, and of that, at this time, there is no bed that is occupied for the uh, critically ill in terms of IC or mechanical ventilation. We would have assigned 14 beds for HDU and um, we would have had 0%, but then uh, one person is in fact being cared for in an HDU-like setting. With respect to COVID isolation generally, Minister would have made mention of the fact that though we had a significant number, our highest would have been over 1,200 beds that we would have assigned for COVID, there has been a natural de-escalation of the numbers of beds assigned for COVID care. Uh, and this would have been as a result of what we would have seen. And so there has been a closure of some of our field hospitals, even though we do have the continual use and function of our field hospital at the Spanish Town Hospital, but we'd have had a closure of the field hospital at St. Joseph's Hospital. And a number of other isolation beds would have been reassigned to general care. And so our percentage occupancy of our general isolation beds would have been somewhere between 23 and 35% over the last um, recent times. In contrast to a, a much lower percent of less than 10% in March. So that is to say that we are noting that there have been less numbers of beds assigned because of the reassignment to general use for other conditions besides COVID. And with respect to our critical uh, beds, they have not been uh, used in most recent times because of the significant less number of our patients who are critically ill. And I will make reference, more reference to this in a slide that is coming up. So if you look at a general summary of our hospital beds, we categorize them according to COVID. They're not AMBO, which means it's not between 75 and 85% occupancy, but in fact, they are less than 75% occupancy, and therefore they would have been designated green. In contrast, there is um, an increase or relatively higher occupancy rate in our southern region and our western region in some hospitals. And we would, and, and the green would be assigned in NERA and, and SERA, Southeast Regional Health Authority. And so we would have made note of the fact that there are more persons who are presenting with uh, non-communicable diseases, some diarrheal illnesses, and, and other manifestations of illness which require care, surgical and non-surgical. So in summary, what we have here is that generally, as the minister would have made mention of, and Dr. Carr would, Dr. Webster Carr would have, uh, would have already said, with respect to our hospitalization, our COVID hospitalizations are very modest, even though they have been noting an increase in the numbers of persons who are hospitalized. And yet with respect to our non-COVID cases, we, the level of occupancy in the Northeast region uh, of our country, as well as Southeast is fairly modest. And um, with an eye, we have to keep an eye on Southeast Regional Health Authority where we would have noted an increase in the numbers or a higher number of cases in uh, hospitals such as Maypen and, and Mandeville and Lionel Town. And yet in the West, where we do have consideration for SAV, as has been an issue in recent times, as well as Noel Holmes. When we look at the cumulative um, or the cumulative numbers of persons who are severely ill, and we would have 
categorize them into the moderately ill, the critically ill, and the severely ill. Um, and so the moderately ill is in the blue line, the severely ill in the orange line, and the critically ill in the gray line. We would have observed what would have happened over the last, um, from the 1st of January of last year, 2021, until, until now. And so the, the, we would have been able to observe the, the waves that Dr. Webster would have made mention of. And we had seen uh, essentially a, a, a reduction in our severely ill persons. And this would have been significant. We would have noted that the significant changes had occurred in September of last year and March of, 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 uh, of, of this year and January of this year, pardon me. And so this is, a, this is a graph which is showing our moderately, severely and critically ill, which, which demonstrates the times when we had those rises in numbers, September of last year and January of this year. But when we break it down to look at what has happened over the last three weeks, we do, not, we do recognize that there has been a modest increase, again, in our moderately ill, as well as our severely ill, and then our critically ill. So we would have noted that really there's one person who would have been critically ill over the last period of time. And then we would have noted recently that there are two persons who are designated to be uh, severely ill. And I dare say that with respect to the critically ill, right now, um, there is one person who is a neonate, in fact, a one month old, who has significant comorbidities significant comorbidities, which would render him to be um, more at risk, as well as one of the two persons who have been designated to be severely ill is also a child at one year old with severe heart disease, again, with comorbidities. So it is important to note with respect to our severely ill, there has been a, had been a significant decrease in numbers, but we do note that there is a mild uptick over the last uh, three weeks. And so with respect to one, our use of equipment during the times of being critically ill, with respect to the trends in the use of our high flow nasal oxygen and our ventilator, we would have again noted the increase in numbers at the times of the, of the surges because they would parallel the numbers of persons who are in fact affected. So what we're seeing here is that there has been a, a, a flattening of that curve just about over the last, since you know March, we would have seen no increase in the numbers when we look at it in this large graph. But when we take it out and we look at the use of the high flow nasal oxygen and mechanical ventilator um, in this period of time, and this should actually be over the last three weeks from April the 25th, we know that there actually has just been one person on high flow nasal oxygen until this week when there was another person. So, and then there was nobody on a mechanical ventilator. So what this is actually saying is that the critically ill persons have remained uh, modest as I had made mention of, and yet there is um, still, we have to pay attention because there was an increase in the number. This is far different from what it was before, and yet it is important to pay attention. There are two other, there are two other, uh, there are two other um, points that we pay attention to, and this is our persons in hospital. Again, we had noticed that there is a slight uptick, and then we note again when we break it down in for the last three weeks that we can actually see the increase in numbers for our persons who are peripartum, those who are pregnant or they are in, or they've just had a baby. And then for, with respect to our children, importantly, we also have noticed a slight uptick in the numbers. And when we break it down, we realize that there has been a creep up of numbers of children in hospital with COVID. This is important to note. Um, and this like, person throughout the country. And our last slide, takes us to exactly what Minister and Dr. Webster have been saying. This slide tells us that among the severely ill, of the 18 people who are severely ill, 15 moderately ill, two severely ill, and one critically ill, all of them are unvaccinated. So this underscores what we are saying, 
to say that um, it is important to be vaccinated because it, it is supposed to help to prevent us from being severely ill. So with that, I present to you what is the status of patients in the hospital uh, at this time. Thank you, Minister. Over. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Uh, Nadine Williams. Uh, appreciate the presentation. Uh, and the, the, I, earlier, I just to reiterate what she said earlier, I had indicated that the fifth wave had some characteristics that are somewhat different from previous waves. Um, and the, this was brought out in this presentation in terms of hospitalization. So it's important that in the conversation that we have, we look at each wave uh, as, as distinct. Uh, while there has to be some comparisons, we must not see each as the same. Um, again, not a reason to be complacent, but in this wave, we're seeing less severe illnesses, less deaths, less hospitalization, and indeed, where we have suspected cases um, or even confirmed cases, the stay in hospital is normally less. The trend is suggesting that uh, discharges are just below admissions. And so it is the net effect of that is that we are holding somewhat in terms of the level of hospitalization. I did say between 150 to 180 over the month of May, even with the high increase in positivity. That's a qualitative distinction that is worth noting um, to say, be careful, manage yourself. If you're sick, go home, uh, get tested. There are lots of home test kits that should be out there now. Um, let's try to maintain some sense of normality because it's important for other reasons, but don't be complacent. And at the same time, do not panic because we are continuing to observe, to watch the trends, to monitor the trends. And as of now, the trends are not putting us in a sort of red danger zone, even though there are still some ways to go in observing how this surge is going to play out. Uh, thank you for that, Dr. Nadine Williams. Now, the next presenter that we have is my colleague, Minister, Minister Fable Williams, and she will speak to us on education because one of the big decisions that the government took, of course, was to allow face-to-face which I, we, we all agree was necessary, having had the children out for nearly two years or so. And uh, there are some challenges within the school system. We anticipated those challenges from a public health perspective. We, we, we always knew that it would mean the possibility, the probability of greater spread of the virus because of the way the institutions are set up, close proximity between children, um, you know, just their regular routine activities on their on their respective campuses. And we are seeing some evidence of that now playing out. Um, however, again, uh, the, the qualitative distinction around whether persons are sick sufficient to be hospitalized or just display symptoms to be overcome with time um, is worthy of note. And, and Mr. Williams, and I uh, and the teams have been discussing the way forward, at least for now. So, Minister Williams, thanks for have, thanks for being on, and I now turn over to you to give sure. any additional detail. Thank you so much, Minister Tufton. Let me acknowledge the members of your team: P.S. Brian, uh, CMO, Dr. Ennis, and others. Let me acknowledge as well Dr. Kassan Troop, our Chief Education Officer, acting from the Ministry members of the media first. Let me reiterate to all those who are on what Minister Tufton said earlier on, that this is a press briefing, and that to say we at the Ministry of Education and Youth will be doing some town, town hall meetings to allow our parents, principals, teachers, and other stakeholders to be able to ask questions. Um, so let me start by saying that I know all of us were delighted at the news that our students were able to go back fully into the face-to-face -face environment. Um, and while at the time, back in early March, while the physical distancing rules could not be observed in all cases, we stressed the continued adherence to hand washing or sanitization 
as regularly as possible. We asked our school leaders to ensure no large gatherings, to ensure as best as possible frequent mask breaks. And while the mask mandate was lifted, we continued to encourage our students or teachers and other administrators to continue to wear their mask. Since our students returned to face-to-face -to -face on March 7th, we continue, continue to monitor the education sector for incidents of COVID-19 infections. Over the past two to three weeks, we have seen an increase in the number of persons who are suspected or confirmed to be infected within our schools. And I'll get to those numbers shortly. Um, in response, uh, we again disseminated a recent bulletin to the education system, alerting our stakeholders about the current situation and reminding them to enforce the COVID-19 protocols to ensure the safe operations of schools. Uh, school administrators were also asked to resensitize all key stakeholders about the protocols to be observed, including the frequent washing of hands, temperature checks, wearing of masks, mass breaks, and so on. All of our schools, as you know, have isolation centers for use if they notice signs of, um, uh, you know, whether it's runny nose, coughing, or so on. Uh, at the start of our face-to-face, -face, we asked our classroom teachers to be extra vigilant for signs and to isolate as quickly as, as possible. And I know that they have been very vigilant in doing this based on the reports that we've been getting. Our infection prevention and control recommendations for employers, interim guideline for COVID-19 and the interim guidelines for workplace protocols were also reshared, meaning we sent them out again um, to all our stakeholders in the education sector as a quick reference guide for our schools. And we also shared reminders of strategies that can be used um, and should be used in our school environment. Um, we, just to get down to um, the numbers, uh, let me, I know we have a chart, Chantal, I don't know if you can get that up. So um, just to, to say during the month of May, um, when we looked at the first week in May, 138 suspected or confirmed cases came to our attention. Of that number, 99 were suspected among students with 22 confirmed as positive. Eight were suspected uh, and seven positive were reported among teachers. Additionally, there was one actual case and one suspect, suspected um, reported in an independent school. We also note um, in the next week um, that some high schools have reported that they have reverted to remote teaching, the, to the virtual teaching environment for some students in some classes due to the suspected and confirmed cases of COVID-19 among um, teachers and students. So for example, Kingston College's Melbourne campus reverted its grade seven to nine to online since last week into the Labor Day weekend to resume on May 26 with face-to-face. -face. And there are some other schools um, you'll see on the screen that indicated to us that they might have had to send of a class or so into the virtual space um, in order to be able to continue school. For the week ending May 13th, among our students, there were 446 suspected cases and 136 actual. Among our teachers, 160 suspected and about 105 actual. In other categories, we saw 11 suspected cases and four actual. So in total, we had reports of 617 suspected cases and 245 actual. We're gonna take this opportunity again to appeal to the general public and specifically our students or parents or teachers or staff um, to please observe the public health advisories. We and continue to encourage wearing of your masks, sanitizing, washing your hands frequently, observing uh, physical distancing still, because everyone knows that this is good for the health of everyone. 
um, and we will continue to, of course, uh, you know, uh, ensure that we get the reports on a weekly basis so that we can monitor and continue to provide guidance uh, for our schools. Um, Dr. Tufton, that's what I have for now. I know that we are working to ensure that um, our exam students, those who test positive, are still able to do their test and we will um, give our school guidance as quickly as we can on that matter. So thank you so much. Um, over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Minister Williams. Um, we will continue to work together. This is health and education because we, we do discern that um, the face-to-face the -face classes represents a vulnerable space in the wave because again, of the school environment, the, the close proximity between students in classroom settings, their um, not so diligent observation of physical distancing or social distancing, whether in the cafeteria, on the playing field or otherwise, uh, it's natural. But I will continue to reiterate that to keep our children out of school beyond the two plus years that they were out, um, would have had and has had a debilitating effect that is far more intense than, than them being in the school environment, um, even at the risk of contracting COVID. The evidence is suggesting, the data, that while we are having uh, cases in the schools, and the schools do have a capacity to do testing, working with the Ministry of Health, we have the home test kits, and if there are further suspicions, we, we elevate that to the health centers or the hospitals for further testing. Um, while we are seeing positive cases, we're not seeing cases that are severe to the point of hospitalization or even death. And that is the normal trend globally. And I think that's very important. So I'm not suggesting that it is risk-free. I'm suggesting that but we are suggesting as a government that there is a greater risk to isolating them for so long. And the risk that they face or the overwhelming part is really a risk of contracting the virus and then going home for the protocol is 10 days, 10 days or so, or, or until they get a positive, a negative test. Uh, so we continue to advise that if they are sick, if they have a flu-like symptoms, cold, coughing, sneezing, that sort of thing, that they be tested, you can do a home test kit, or, or they stay home. And that applies to everyone. But I, I want to just reiterate that as it relates to the, to, the, to the children. To the extent that they live, the kids that is, live with older populations, you know, grandmothers, grandfathers, that kind of observation becomes more important. And so parents and guardians um, should, be, should see their role as being you know, very observant, being vigilant to ensure that to the extent that children may appear to have some symptoms that they manage that at home, as well as the teachers managing at, at the, school, the school environment. Uh, so, in closing, and uh, just before the questions are, are allowed, I want to just take the opportunity to reiterate the importance of the, the, the self-monitoring, which is important. Um, the, the general principle of trying to balance lives and livelihoods to get the socioeconomic issues that are of also critical importance um, addressed, even while we manage this, this virus to say that the virus is still very much there, still represents a threat, and to confirm the fifth wave, but with some distinction around the features of the wave as it relates to hospitalization, as it relates to deaths, but to encourage Jamaicans to continue to uh, wear your mask where you think you're at risk, sanitize, social distance, and if you're sick, stay home. Uh, until you're better or until a test is administered. And there is there are ample self-kits available 
Within our public health system, the NHF has bought a number of kits and those are distributed throughout in the health centers. And we will do our best to ensure where we can to make those available for testing. Otherwise, of course, you can get a test done at a private entity. Um, so thank you now, and I will now turn over to Stephen for any questions. Stephen. Thank you very much, Minister. So again, we're going to invite our media colleagues on the Zoom to use the raise hand feature to ask their questions. And I'm going to begin with a question, question from Kimon Francis from the Gleaner. She's asking, Dr. Webster has indicated that the parish's hardest hit are in the West. Is there a correlation between the statistics there and those parishes being in the country's tourism belt? Her second question is, should we discontinue testing for those coming into the island? Uh, Dr. Webster, you want to take that first question, given that you made the presentation? Yes, thanks. Um, so it, it is a fact. Um, these are the locally acquired cases, though. So, um, so th this is what has been observed. I can't say correlation, but it is what it is, you know. So it is um, very clear that these are the parishes with the highest numbers currently. Over. Okay, and I think the second question was about testing um, coming into the island. So, as you know, the decision was taken to remove those tests. Um, again, it, it, it is a decision born out of the need to move back into a normal posture around uh, travel and work and you know other critical industries like tourism and so on. Um, if if we okay sorry about that um can you please mute your mics please if you're not recognized to speak so i was saying that if, if it, that decision was taken at the highest level of the executive of government based on a considered view around restoration of some sense of normality to the economy to the society um, and that is a position that currently holds still until and unless the executive arm reconsiders it um, so i would say to persons who are traveling, um, you know, protect yourself. The truth is that you don't need to wear a mask on a plane anymore. I mean, I, I'm, I've been traveling the last couple of days, long flights, and there is no, you know, many persons don't wear a mask. Persons volunteer to wear a mask. So it's not mandatory. Um, so, you know, you live in a society where it, 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 everything is connected but there is a choice that can be made and one should exercise that option where one feels at risk and our role as health is to say to jamaicans protect yourself there are options the vaccination is the first and most significant but then there are the other non-clinical the mask wearing the sanitizing and others and, and that's the position as of now thank you thank you minister we go to Alfia Saunders from the Jamaica Observer. Hi, good morning. Um, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, please. Okay, all right. I have two questions regarding vaccination. The first one is, is the ministry doing its own assessment of vaccine waning outside of what the manufacturers or even the WHO says? And I ask this question um, because there has been some international reports of evidence of waning of the Pfizer vaccine, for example, against Omicron, the Omicron variant within weeks of the second and the third doses. So that question is for the CMO. And then the other question for Dr. Tufton is, are we seeing uh, any kind of resistance or hesitancy in the take-up of boosters 
what exactly is the situation on the ground with that? Thank you. Okay. Um, I, I would want us to refer to the, the last epidemiological report that was put out by the WHO that was dated May 11th. That gives a summary of the studies that have been done that shows that yes, um, after vaccination, there is there is a some decrease in um, in immunity against uh, some the variants. However, for the severely ill persons, the level of vaccine effectiveness remains high. So we have for the for the Pfizer vaccine, the report says that um, after the primary immunization, the vaccine effectiveness is still greater than 70%. And after the third dose, it is still greater than 70%. Um, there has been, uh, for the persons who have gotten the other vaccines, there may be between 50 to 70% vaccine effectiveness. However, for the severely ill persons, the vaccine effectiveness remains high. And so therefore it does, it does protect against hospitalization, severe illnesses and deaths. Um, and on the, on the issue of, of the boosters, yes, the, the, those who have, based on the data I have here in front of me, only 34,881 doses were given as boosters. Um, and if you compare that with uh, 696, well, um, 593,866 who have had second doses and 100,000, so about 700,000 persons will be considered fully vaccinated if you apply the normal standards of the double dose. Then with all 30 odd thousand taking boosters, it, it clearly suggests a very large gap although maybe the timing would apply to some not being qualified as yet, but that would be a small number given the load take up over the last few months. So the appeal is worth making that, as said earlier, the, the effectiveness of the two doses does wane over time and the boosters are clinically proven to offer added support. And in the midst of a surge, as we are now experiencing, uh, despite the fact that this may be not as Hello? impactful, it is imp Okay, apparently I got muted. I was saying in the, it, there, there's still a large gap for persons of persons who have not taken their boosters and would encourage uh, those who have not to go ahead and, and get bo their booster. But I um, just wanted to add, Minister, in response to your question about whether or not we were doing any, any studies here. Um, we're not actually doing studies, but the, the data does show that in terms of the persons that are admitted to hospital, it is the unvaccinated persons that are admitted to hospital. And so that, that does suggest that um, we still have vaccine protecting our population uh, with the decreased numbers that we are seeing hospitalized and even more so with decreased numbers that, that are being severely and critically ill. Thank you very much, Seymour. Thank you, Minister. I'm going to go to Zara Burton. Okay, I'm on, everybody hearing, right? Okay. I have a question both for the CMO and also for Dr. Webster Carr. Dr. Webster Carr, a few, I think it was in March, Dr. Tuckland had said that our per capita death rate has been better than the world average and fairly significantly so. I asked you in an email to clarify that point for me and I'm asking again today, because our PM, Mr. Honest, said similarly at the National Press Club in DC when he went up recently on his official state visit. This information is out there. The analyst at Our World in Data that I contacted said that the data is showing, their data is showing that Jamaica is actually above 
the world average when it came to our per capita death rate? Are you using a different measure to measure death per capita? Because this is obviously very important um, for us to be clear and transparent about what this is. So I need to know as a chief epidemiologist for the country, where are we versus the world average? So that's question one. Two. Uh, this is for Dr. Bissis of McKinsey. I wanted to ask about the resignations recently from the Ministry of Health. Dr. Espinosa Campbell being one, it was said here, looking at the Observer article. It is understood that Dr. Espinosa Campbell resigned after moves to confirm her in the post were allegedly blocked by a senior technocrat in the ministry. I want to get a sense of whether that technocrat is you and how do you respond to that resignation? How do you interpret what that resignation was about? Um, Dr. Epsakar? Okay. Um, thank you, Piers. Um, so I, I don't have the comparative data, but there's one methodology for for the the calculation. Um, and globally, that's what is used. So, um, but what we do, what many other countries don't do, is we go back and look retrospectively on our debts and we reclassify while other countries will just move on. So sometimes um, when there's an increase in cases, it's counted against us, but we are showing up our data and we are giving the real data, even if it's retrospective. So, um, that's that's where we are, but the calculation is is standard throughout. Over. Oh, sorry. What does that mean in real terms? Is our death per capita rate above or below the world average? That's what I need to know. I, I really I don't understand what you just said. I would like you to be very specific. I would have to investigate that. I I can't I can't answer that question right now. I would have to investigate and what I would have to do is get better data than on a, a website because what happens in our world in data and other sites is that it, it reports what a country um, puts out each day. For Jamaica, this is what I was explaining, for Jamaica, yesterday we would have um, put out two deaths two deaths and both deaths occurred last year, but it will be counted against us for this year. Um, so that's what I'm, I'm saying. So if we look one-on-one, -on -one, we would be better off. But um, so I can't know what's behind the other person's data, right? So that's what I'm explaining to you. Um, so, but if we look, time by time we would be better off okay so you can commit for next time around to give us a definitive data point on that please i i, I can't commit to it because i'm not sure what is available if if what i can do i can look at um point on point for us and not look at our back data which is what they are doing but then um you ask for transparency, how would you then compare? So um, I put a, a, a um, provisor on it that um, it's based on what data is out there for other countries. Over. All right, um, with regards to your second question, um, the relationship the HR relationship in the Ministry of Health and Relations, uh, Health and Wellness is such that at this point in time, we have persons who are very attractive to different um, organizations internationally and otherwise uh, because of the wealth of experience that they have gathered, especially during COVID-19. 
the fact of the matter is that the two persons that you refer to, um, one um, received an appointment in an international organization, um, a regional. regional organization, and the other made a personal decision around her own advancement. Now, I also have seen the Observer article, and I am concerned that there may be some misinterpretation of the behavior or the action of the officers who were always uh, um, stalwart professionals and therefore they, we, we support them in their advancement in their career and we look forward to their own contribution to this country as they go into the international domain and participate and bring back valuable knowledge to the government um, one, if and when they decide to return to Jamaica. Thank you very much, Pierce. I have a question from Christopher Patterson from the GIS. He's asking, what's the protocol for students sitting external exams and are confirmed COVID positive? I, I think the minister uh, referenced that issue and indicated that she would return to the country shortly with a position around the, the sitting of exams and the protocol involved. Um, I'm not sure if she's still online, but the general position that we have discussed, subject to cabinet's consideration and approval, given that the, the law uh, has some restrictions on allowing that to happen, is that we should move in a direction to allow students who are not sick meaning not displaying debilitating symptoms to within a particular protocol, uh, sit their exams. Um, and I, I believe the minister will shed greater light on that in the coming day or days. Yes, Dr. Tufton, um, I know the Ministry of Education and Youth has been discussing this with the Ministry of Health and Wellness as to the guidelines to follow. Um, uh, so we await the necessary approvals, but just to say as a for example, um, uh, you know, there would be a specific classroom or classrooms dedicated for that student or those students. And there, there are requirements in terms of how the invigilators um, would need to be um, attired in terms of the types of masks that they would wear and so on. Just, just as an example of the restrictions that would be if there are students who confirm to us that they are, uh, you know, tested positive for COVID-19. Thank you very much, ministers. Just have a final question from Kimon Francis. She's asking how confident is the Ministry of Health and Wellness in terms of persons reporting for the self-test kits, the results to the ministry, to, to the local authorities regarding the self-test kits. How confident are we that we're getting all the reports from the self-test kits? Do they report it to the authorities? Um, well, in terms of gone? confidence, you know, it, it is the, when persons do the self-test, you know, it is their, um, they, they decide whether or not they report it. We would encourage them to report the test results to the health department so that we would be able to keep a track on the numbers of positives that we're getting from the self-test kits. What we know is that for persons who have the self-test kits who may require um, leave from work where they're formally engaged, then those persons are more likely to report the test so that they can get their quarantine order so that they will have the time off for persons that are informally employed um, or who may not require that, uh, that certification, they may not. Uh, so we can't be confident in the numbers that we're getting, um, but we do encourage persons to report the test result to the health department so that we can keep a track on the numbers. Thank you very much, CMO. So our final question is coming from Alfia Saunders from The Observer. All right. All right. I have a question and a half. Um, what has become of the efforts to acquire vaccines for children under 12 and for Minister Williams? 
are schools being given test kits? I don't know if I missed that before. All right, so with regards to test kits, um, schools were initially given an allocation of 5,000 um, test kits across the system. Um, we will be following up with, with the Ministry of Health and Wellness in terms of additional amounts to be distributed across our schools because 5,000, even though it sounds like a big number, when you look at the number of schools that are out there, um, almost a thousand schools, when you do the math, you'll see on a per school basis, it's not a lot. So we do have to get more of the um, test kits into our schools and in particular, now that we're here uh, in terms of the, um, uh, the situation that we are beginning to observe. In terms of the 5 to 11 age group um, for which vaccines have been approved, we, we are in dialogue with um, countries in order to, to procure some of these vaccines. And we have good indication from both the United Kingdom and from Spain that we would be able to get 5 to 11 um, vaccines available. However, we don't have a, a specific time on when these would arrive in country. So we're not able to update the country yet as to when we would start that vaccination. However, we are in discussions and negotiations concerning getting these vaccines. All right, thank you very much, CMO. Those are all the questions that we have from our media colleagues. I'll hand back to our minister to give his closing remarks. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> but let me again thank those who are online, uh, the many parents and teachers who came on. I appreciate your cooperation in listening in. And I know Minister Williams will do a town hall virtually to, to further give you details and respond to any concerns or queries. Uh, thanks to the team. Uh, this has been an unusual setup, given where we are, us three, and where the rest of the team are located. But thanks to all for technology. Um, and we did think it was necessary to keep the country informed on where we are as it relates to COVID and the declaration of the fifth wave once the confirmation of the statistics um, were in place. Uh, as I've said, it is important that we recognize that there is a balancing act at play. And I know that some may be critical around not taking more drastic measures as we have done in the past. But again, we have been at this for two plus years. Uh, we have learned a lot. Uh, we have been able to learn from the mistakes, strengthen the right decisions that we have taken. Um, the team in the field have been diligently working on it and understand the process a lot more. And there are solutions in terms of protection, vaccines, and the other critical non-clinical measures that we can choose to exercise once we feel vulnerable. In addition to that, tests are now more widely available, um, you know, over the counter, relatively accurate, but then you can elevate that to higher levels if the necessity arises if you're ill. And so we ask Jamaicans to think through their own path to protecting themselves and to doing what is right for them, for their families, for their communities by extension. Because if we do that collectively, we will do what is right for the country. And we'll be able to maintain work, we'll be able to maintain play, we'll be able to maintain church settings, um, all the other things that are important for our psychosocial therapy, or, or should I say normality of, of life and living. And so I really would want us to maintain that posture of being aware and being cautious while still going about doing what is essential for life, uh, given that we do need to have a holistic approach to how we exist. We will continue to keep you informed in terms of new developments. If hospitalization trends begin to go out uh, into the concerning zones of the red, uh, and we feel that we are at a much greater risk, we will signal that before 
And of course, the cabinet of Jamaica would be in a position to take decisions even before that, because those decisions are uh, executive decisions, um, which is normally the case. I, I want to just close by saying that the data that we give, uh, whether it is uh, debt per capita or others, um, are is data that we take significant time and effort to calculate and to assess, and we maintain our position around those data that is provided. Um, we have consistently provided information that our debt to per capita rate has been below the global average. Um, where the, the data changes over time, because clearly this is a moving target. And so once the change reflects otherwise, that information will be provided. But I'm very confident in the data that we provide. And I would not like us to be under any impression as a country that somehow we are misleading the population. This team does not do that. We have never done it, uh, at least knowingly. Um, and if we say something and then determine that this may not be the case anymore, then we recalibrate and provide information. We're confident in the team. I am confident in the team. And I continue to remain confident in the approach that we have taken to providing the country with all the information um, so that they can in turn make an informed decision around how they treat with this particular situation. Thank you very much and have a good day or a good evening. And uh, we will continue to keep you updated on these new developments around COVID. Thanks to Minister Fable Williams and her team, and thanks to my team at the Ministry of Health and Wellness. Thank you. Recording stopped.